Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. And welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. You're here live with Dr. Jeff Werber here as your host for the next 30 minutes here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. That's me. We're here for you. We're here for your pets. We're here to answer questions, talk about anything you want to talk about. For those shy ones there, I'm always prepared, however. But if you want to get hold of me, easy way to do it, 877-385-8882. Once again, 877-385-8882. Or better yet, you can log on to Pet Life Radio, click on Go Under Shows, Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff, and... You can actually live catch us right here on Google Hangouts. There's a link left for you. Just click on it, and we can see you hopefully with your pet or pets in arms on your lap, sitting next to you if it's a big guy, and um, whatever questions you may have. Uh, there's, there's the best way to do it. You know, it's, it's free. It doesn't cost anything of advice. You know, oftentimes I'll meet people, and uh, you know, I say I'm drawn to their pets. I cannot walk by a pet and not bend down to, you know, give it a pet, hug it, kiss it, whatever the case may be. And, you know, we'll start talking. People ask me a question. Clearly, they've been to a vet recently, and they had some issues or questions about what the problem or problems were, and they just really didn't understand it. They didn't understand the essence. Veterinarians are often very busy. Sometimes they may not have the art, the skill to be able to explain things well, and you have to sit and make a decision based on some misinformation or non-information. That's really tough. So here's a great way to get some information. I'll help you through it, give you the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever the case may be, and um, hopefully help you with your pets, make them feel better, make you feel better. And that's why I'm here. We have the holidays coming up. Christmas is literally around the corner, Monday, tomorrow evening, Christmas Eve. So we're going to talk about some pet safety issues. I'm sure you know them, but I'm going to give you a a refresher. I was gone for the last couple of weeks. I was... uh, doing one of the uh, local CBS affiliates here in Los Angeles two weeks ago, of course, talking about this. And then I was in Park City, Utah, having some fun on my snowboard. But I did go one day. We uh, I took a, the shuttle Uber to Salt Lake City, about 40 minutes, and did their Fox affiliate. And we talked about the holidays. So it's always a, a pretty hot topic. And if you are in certain parts of the country, it's a cold topic. But here in LA, it's a pretty nice, mild topic. So anyway, just before we get uh, going, I want to—I do want to talk about some other stuff in the news. Another food recall. I know you're so surprised because I give these all the time. And what you're going to realize is, and I, I'm not making any judgments here, not at all. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that it, it does happen with a lot of raw diets. Cow pie pet foods, not a food recall made by Columbia River Natural Pet Foods. And the problem is listeria, just another another type of parasite. And as I said, I am not that I'm not against raw diets. It's that animals' digestive tracts are not in the same shape they were. It's not the same bacteria in the gut that there were before pre-domestication. And they cannot handle Many of them, I should say, cannot handle many of the raw diets. I do support and like those companies that have some stage, some step in the production process where without cooking, they can actually destroy the bacteria. And uh, that's something that, that I always look for. There are some brands out there that do it, and I do support them. You know, Again, more importantly than that, uh, I don't argue with success. So if you are out there and you've been feeding your dog a particular raw food and your dog is doing great, then by all means, stay with it. But if they're not doing great, just know that there are some problems out there, very common, Campylobacter, Listeria, Salmonella, E. coli, all of these bacteria that can cause some issues. Oh, this is also, the rabies cases, this is in Catawba County, North Carolina, higher this year than the past two years combined. So if you're anywhere in the, you know, sort of southeast uh, where we do see rabies, make sure you keep your pets vaccinated. And most, well, in all states, it's required by law, but- People seem to slack off, even those that don't love to give unnecessary vaccines. I get it. But if you're not going to do a very expensive titer test that you can prove that your pet is still protected um, against rabies from its last prior vaccine, then get the vaccine. Keep them safe. Here it is. We're going to talk about this today, but just beware of table scraps, holiday decorations, etc. But in the second half of the show, we'll be a little bit more specific going into the do's and don'ts. 
when it comes to the holidays. Here's one. Again, we've talked about this, and it's going to show up and continue to show up. So just get used to it. Marijuana legalization. More pets are at risk. Exposure can cause injury, seizures, coma, and even death. There's no antidote so for marijuana yet. So just be really, really careful. Now, in states that marijuana is legal for recreational use, California now is one. Of course, Colorado has been legal for a while. Understand that the it's the THC that's the, the main culprit. CBD, cannabidiol, is really, it's not toxic. The, the issue is we just don't know enough about it to be able to comfortably recommend a type or a dose or a ratio of CBD to THC, et cetera. In many states now, pure CBD, it's got to be something like 99.6 or 99.8% pure CBD is not even considered a drug anymore. It's considered a supplement or an additive, and uh, thus you can use it. But interestingly, here in California, until more studies and more research is done, we as veterinarians, even though you could take it, it is not legal for us to take it. I got to turn my phone off. Hang on. So it's one of those things where it's a big problem. So I would say that beware and don't think it's cute when you put this stuff online and you show pictures of your pets that were, you know, got into the the edibles or got into the smoke and they're, you know, sort of aimlessly wandering and they're falling on their faces, et cetera. Not funny and potentially dangerous. As a matter of fact, and I've reported this before, that since legalization, there's been a fourfold increase in visits to emergency centers because of marijuana toxicity. So understand that though much of the marijuana plant is safe and it's the THC is usually the culprit of bad reactions, there are CBD, CBN, there are other things out there that may be okay, but we just don't know enough. So my recommendation, the industry's recommendation from the veterinary standpoint is still to stay away until we know more or make sure what you're using is basically THC free, pure cannabidiol. We talked about this the other, uh, I don't know, weeks and weeks and weeks ago, but um, again, with the fires here in Southern California, it sort of hit the news again, that tilapia skin, skin from the tilapia fish, they make bandages and they work extremely well to help burn pads and paws. They it Basically, what it does is it, it sort of acts as a dermal substitute and um, it provides a lot of pain relief and uh, protection. It transfers collagen from the tilapia skin to the the animal skin and uh, it acts as a great matrix to bond tissue and uh, it really really works well so that there's going to be much much more i think that we're going to see a lot in burn victims a lot of plastic surgery cases where tilapia skin or other skin from other fish um, is going to be used and uh, i think that's it's really amazing oh there's a Two things I wanted to talk about. Number one is um, this was a, a great story for you. I thought it was kind of funny. Here it is, holiday time. And it's joyous. And we like to celebrate. And we like to visit with our neighbors and, and et cetera, et cetera. Right? So here's one for you. A thief pulled up to a veterinary hospital in Mackville, North Carolina, and stole their Christmas tree right off their front lawn. They have them on video of disconnecting the lights that were attached to some power you know, supply in the front and stuffing it into his Ford Focus and driving away. Now, that's talk about the holiday spirit. That's a good one for you, right? So come on, leave the Christmas trees alone. This is Board Vet Hospital. They were trying to celebrate the holiday, and now they're doing it without the Christmas tree. That's pretty unbelievable. And also, this is a little frightening for a lot of you horse people out there, and that is that I'm going to name a bunch of diseases that, interestingly, that horses can pass to us and we can pass to horses. And it's going to blow your mind. So ringworm, which is a fungal infection. Rabies. Well, of course, any mammal can pass rabies to another. Drug-resistant staph aureus. You've heard of the term MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Well, that can be passed on. Those resistant bacteria can be passed on from horse to people. Salmonella. Cryptosporidium. Giardia, anthrax. I mean, do you believe this? And what's worse, we could pass these same things to them. So um, the bottom line is be really careful that you're healthy, that your horses are healthy. If you have horses, make sure they're checked out by your veterinarian. You know, we know that certain diseases like toxoplasmosis can be directed from cats to people, and that can have terrible effects especially for pregnant women. But when you think, you know, we always talk about the dogs and the cats that are transmitting diseases back and forth. We don't talk much about horses, but it can happen. The good news is that some really bad diseases that horses get, the Venezuelan equine encephalitis, 
the Western and Eastern equine encephalitis and the West Nile virus, those cannot be passed on from a horse to people. So those you don't have to worry about. But anyway, it's just really interesting to see that there are you know plenty of things out there that can be dangerous. Now, one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about, there is a condition that uh, we see in mostly dogs. I've had a few in a cat, but mostly it's dogs called the hematoma. By show of hands, how many of you have had pets that have had hematomas? Well, certainly it happens pretty commonly. So basically what's a hematoma? A hematoma is a blood blister either because the dog is scratching at his head vigorously and pops a blood vessel in there and the ear flap itself, we call that the pinna, or they're shaking their head anxiously, vigorously, and as those ears are flopping back and forth, it hits like an edge, hits the corner of a table, and boom, pops a vessel. So the ear flap, called the pinna, there are two sides, right? And all of a sudden, because the broken blood vessel, it kind of fills up like this. And now if you look at the pinna, the ear flap, you can feel like a, a soft, mushy, fluid-filled flap, ear flap. And that fluid in there is blood and or serum. And you would think, well, no big deal. We'll stick a little needle in and drain it. And yes, of course, that's what we should do. However, 99 plus percent of the time, it's going to come back from anywhere from hours to days. Why? Because once that vessel or vessels are feeding the ear, the flap, the pinna, just because you drain it, they're still bleeding. You haven't stopped the bleeding. The blood can still go into this hollow space that you've created by draining out the fluid. So what's in the fluid? The fluid is blood, which is serum, right? And blood cells and, uh, or, you know, plasma, you could say with the blood cells. And what's another component of the plasma is what we call fibrin. Fibrin is the meshwork, the matrix that helps clots form. So I'm sure that you have maybe seen, I know you've seen them. Maybe you even have them. Maybe you have kids, any of your kids. Well, now they, they kind of protect the ears in wrestling. But, that, you know, in the old days, back in the day, wrestlers always had what they call cauliflower ear, where their ears just get rock hard with scarring and they get the ear gets contorted. Well, that's what happens. It's the same principle because fibrin, the, even though the blood cells die, the serum or the, is kind of reabsorbed in time. So what's left is the fibrin. And when you don't correct this problem the right way, then you're going to see the flap. I mean, it's, it's okay. It, it's not dangerous, typically. Well, there are some rare cases where it can be, depending on where and how the clot forms. But you will have a pinna, a nice ear flap that's no longer a nice ear flap. It's actually an ugly ear flap because the scarring in there. And that once that happens, there is nothing you can do about it. So when you have a, your dog gets a hematoma, if your dog gets hematoma, maybe in many cases it's more likely when it happens a lot, then you want to have it correctly, uh, surgically corrected. And that is first you can drain it. There are a number of techniques out there. One is putting a cannula in, letting it drain. So there's it, all that stuff will continue to drain out. The technique that we use is we put like a line, we cut in, in size on the inside of the flap through the hematoma, the, the entire length of the hematoma. And we do what's called through and through mattress sutures. And that will eliminate, not only do we drain the blood from the hematoma, but then we, by sandwiching the ear together really tightly, there's no place, you can, you can never find the vessel or vessels, usually more than one. So to try to open it up and ligate them, eh, it's not going to help. So you just basically remove the dead space, all right, by sandwiching these through and through mattress sutures, and they finally it will heal and we actually, I like to leave a little bit of like a, an eighth of an inch, a couple of millimeter space between the two sliced edges, cut edges. And that forms a really nice scar. And that gives you like permanent scarring to maintain the ear flap so it doesn't have any space left on the inside for the hematoma to continue. Anyway, with that, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and talk just a little hint, just a little refresher on holiday hazards. And so don't go away. We'll be right back after these Sit, stay, we'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Today's episode is sponsored by Hanover Square Press and the secret language of cats. How to understand your cat for a better, happier relationship by Suzanne Schatz. Have you ever wondered what your cat is saying? In The Secret Language of Cats, Shots offers a crash course in cat phonics to help you crack the cat code. Perfect for the fans of The Lion in the Living Room and the Inner Life of Animals. The Secret Language of Cats 
by Suzanne Schatz is available for purchase today. Does your dog itch, scratch, stink, or shed like crazy? Come to Dynavite for help. Order a 90-day supply of Dynavite. Dynavite is nutrition. Pick up two bottles of Lico Chops. Get the third bottle free. New improved Lico Chops with omega-3, omega-6, vitamin E. And now, six extra direct-fed microbials. Even better for the digestive tract and immune system. Try Lico Chops. Buy two, get one free. At Dynavite.com. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. And welcome back. You're here live with Dr. Jeff Werber. Here, your host on Pet Life Radio. Ask the Pets is Dr. Jeff. And before the break, as we discussed, we wanted to just go a, a quick rundown on the holiday hazards, only because it's tomorrow night. We're starting again. So kind of run down a brief list. First of all, the decorations, holly, mistletoe, poinsettia. These are all, I mean, could be somewhat irritating to the throat to, if they eat them. Tinsel, I mean, got anything. It's like kitty spaghetti. You know, they, the cats would love that stuff. And as we know, cats are notorious for getting what we call string foreign bodies. So they love to uh, to play with that. So when we really want to be careful with that. When you think about ornaments, you know, the, the glass or even now nowadays plastic balls. Well, guess what? Can you imagine a Labrador retriever walking into that living room and seeing this tree with a hundred tennis balls on it? And they're going to be going after those balls like crazy. And um, yeah, for them, that's heaven. But guess what? Not so fast, big guy, because those are glass. They're dangerous. So you got to, again, make sure your pets stay away from that. How about the cords? How many, you know, dogs like to chew on exposed electrical cords, whether it's going to be, you know, well, dogs, even cats, even bunny rabbits. Rabbits love to chew on cords. So if you are going to have lights plugged into the wall, which is 120 volts, be really careful. Make sure that the cords are tucked away under a rug where there's no access. What you could do as an alternative, you can buy lights now that don't work on household current work on a 9-volt battery or two D batteries, and it can shine up the tree just as well and burns up less, much less juice. And if the dog chews into those cords, it's not the end of the world, of course, because it's like a, a little zap. It's nothing. So that's something you want to be really careful. And any, you know, kind of play, anything small items of play, ribbons, gifts, you're going to be giving gifts, any of the ribbons that the wrapping material, again, that's going to be very, very tough for dogs and, um, and cats because they love to play with stringy stuff. Now, here's a couple of other things that people don't think about. Candles. A lot of candles, right? They're decorative. They're very nice. Cats are very, very intrigued by flickering flame. They really will go up and they'll try to tap it, try to touch it. And my fear always is that if the cat is a little bit too inquisitive and uh, gutsy, they might actually tip it over. So again, that's something you want to be careful. Second thing, snow globes. Snow globes are really common. Kids love them. And you think, well, Come on, what could be bad about a snow globe? Well, guess what? The inside of those snow globes often have ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol, a.k.a. antifreeze. It gives that viscosity. So when those little snowflakes are falling, they don't flake. They kind of like seem to be floating, which makes obviously the attraction of a snow globe. Now, some of the newer ones are using water and glycerin combo, which obviously is a lot safer. But many, many, many out there are using still the uh, ethylene glycol, very toxic. And what's really bad about ethylene glycol, it is sweet. So if that globe should break and that liquid leaks out, then the dog is going to, or cat, will lap it up because it's really sweet. So um, again, it seems like a benign issue, but it's not so benign. It can be very, very dangerous. Let's talk foods. So, you know, again, we have, you have company over, you have those great, you know, nice little bowls, you have those trays of all this fantastic, like chocolate. I mean, we've got at my office that people are bringing so much chocolate, I'm chocolate it out almost. But dogs love chocolate. And again, the more they eat, the more potentially dangerous. Of course, it kind of goes the most toxic is like pure, not 100% pure cocoa powder. 
and then you got the dark chocolate, and then you got the unsweetened chocolate, and then you go down to the milk chocolate or semi-sweet chocolate, then you go to milk chocolate, then you go to white chocolate. So on the upper part of the list, very potentially dangerous. You get to the down to the bottom of that list, which is white chocolate, it's probably there's ready no cocoa at all. So that's mostly just sugar. Not good for them, but it's not super like, dangerous. How about the bowls of nuts? You have you know, like a trail mix you have out or people munching on the, the walnuts and the macadamia nuts. Those two can be very toxic to pets, very high in fats. And that is just like eating another thing. We have to be careful about fatty foods. So it, the skin of a turkey, any kind of fat, fat around the bone, bone marrow is high in fat. So when you give your pets those great big beef bones with the marrow in it, that could cause pancreatitis. The skin of a chicken or turkey, very fatty, can cause pancreatitis. Again, it's a lot of the nuts out there can cause pancreatitis. So that's definitely a trip to the vet, hospitalization, a couple of days on IV. So it's going to be even more expensive a holiday than you thought it was at the beginning just for giving gifts to people. Raisins and grapes, you know, it's inside the trail mix stuff, or you might have some a nice bowl of, of kind of munchy stuff that people can, you got to be careful. Raisins are toxic to pet. Not, not all, just to, to clarify, we don't know which dogs are going to have this sensitivity to raisins or grapes. There's no test, no way to tell. So therefore, the general recommendation is to be safe is don't do it. I remember, I mean, years ago with my dogs, my Labradors, I would sit in, you know, they were, we would practice catch and I would use my grapes as the thing that they caught. I never, my dogs have never had this problem. So it's out there. We see it. We just don't know how to test or who identify the dogs that have this issue. But uh, those that do, it can be very toxic because of severe kidney disease. So we've got to be very careful. Next up, speaking of really things that are kind of new, anything that's unsweetened. So if you're going to have mints out or candies, sugar-free candies, sugar-free gum, the artificial sweetener that is most commonly used nowadays is called xylitol. Xylitol, very, very toxic to our pets. And again, it messes up their sugar balance. It fools the body and they become extremely hypoglycemic. And it is uh, just something that we have to care about. Also, can cause liver damage, kidney. It's really, really bad. It, it, it'll, it'll blow out a liver. So um, we want to be careful about that too. So um, look, I'm not trying to scare you away from having your pets with you. Of course, you want to have them with you. So think about treats and things that you can give them to play with that are basically developed, designed for them. You don't have to shoo them away. When it comes to your guests, just tell them, please don't feed the pets table scraps from the table. Um, and uh, and look, there are some good things. You can feed some white, you know, chicken breast or turkey breast. White meat is better without the skin. But you don't want to start doing it from the table because then that, that sort of reinforces the behavior when they sit on uh, your lap and they're drooling all over your lap. And then you give them a piece of food. They say, oh, God, that was worth it. <laughs> and you don't do that. But you can take some leftovers afterwards and make sure you give them things that are non-fatty. They do love them. And it's better to give it to them than throw it away. And then, of course, they might like it so much they won't eat their regular dog food anymore. But that's another story. So have a great holiday and enjoy it with your families, with your pets. I will be here next Sunday, just before New Year's, I hope. And we can talk then. If you have any questions you want to answer, anything you want to get a hold of me, very easy to do. You can just send me a, a note to Dr. Jeff, Dr. Jeff at PetLifeRadio.com. You can send me a message on my Facebook or better yet, Instagram at Dr. Jeff Werber. And if nothing else on Instagram, you're going to see a lot of cute animals. I promise you they are adorable. And uh, you can see why I have so much fun doing what I do every single day. Have a great week, everybody. Have a great Christmas. And uh, we will be here next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Have a good week. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.